One of the most important things about Gaia is its ability to self-regulate, to keep the temperature, for example, constant, to keep the amount of the various gases in the air within certain ranges. So it's always to keep the planet habitable. It was life that regulated the planet and looked after the atmosphere and the climate. After I formulated Gaia, the evidence for it began gradually to emerge. To give an example, the production by organisms that live in the ocean of a strange gas called dimethyl sulfide. What happens is, if the ocean surface water gets warm, the algae grow better. It is like the growth of all organisms. It's faster when it's warmer. And as they grow better, they produce more of the gas, dimethyl sulfide, which vents into the atmosphere and ultimately causes a cloud layer to form over the ocean surface. clouds are white and they reflect sunlight back to space and so the more the algae grow the cooler the earth gets. Why should the algae want to do that? Well the, the reason is uh, they have a need to keep the ocean surface waters cool because once the ocean surface water rises above about uh, 14 degrees Celsius it stratifies and then the nutrients that are in the lower water cannot enter that top layer and so the algae living there die of lack of food, quite simply. So they have a strong vested interest in doing anything that will uh, stop the top layer of water from rising above 14 Celsius. So you've got a nice thermostated mechanism there and the whole thing's beautifully stable. So there was one of the great natural cycles at last explained properly. Um, and it was a small triumph of Gaia, which didn't really hit the fan to any extent. Nobody was interested. So it left me with no option but to write a book. If Gaia does exist, then we may find ourselves and all other living things to be parts and partners of a vast being who in her entirety has the power to maintain our planet as a fit and comfortable habitat for life. Uh, there was a lot missing, but the, 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 it was the skeleton of, what was, of the body of theory that was to develop. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. I was astonished, quite astonished, to receive letters and phone calls from religious people. Um, one, one that I remember particularly was the Bishop of Birmingham, uh, Hugh uh, Montefiore. It made me think of what theologians call the immanence of God, that is to say, the Holy Spirit of God working within creation and uh, the way in which these cybernetic controls are set up and uh, make life optimal for human beings to appear in so many different ways, which he describes, um, that immediately put me in, 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 in mind of, of, of the Holy Spirit working within creation. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. I found it very easy to engage with the people who are religious if they want to think of Gaia as an example of God's creation, a living thing that God created. Uh, I'm not saying I think that, but it's a way for them to think about it. Sweet child in time, I was even more astonished with the interest that the New Age, which was a world I, I'd not even in, encountered at all before that. We don't recognise that we are so intimately connected with the Earth and that she is so much a part of us and we are so much a part of her um, that if we don't communicate with her and recognise how we can't live without her, we'll destroy the Earth, we'll destroy her and we'll destroy ourselves.
they took up Gaia not in a way that I liked at all. I much preferred the religious <laughs> approach to the New Age one. It was no help whatever in my battle with the scientists. They say, hey, you know, look, there's nothing but New Age nonsense. The initial response to the Gaia hypothesis, as it then was 30 years ago, was extremely hostile, more than negative, often dismissive, scornful, and persisting in developing this theory meant a degree of isolation from the existing scientific communities that um, Jim was ready to accept. For the scientific establishment, Gaia was a mystical vision of organisms acting cooperatively to benefit Mother Earth. Fanciful nonsense, which, it was claimed, flew in the face of evolutionary theory. The first serious criticism from the scientific community was an article by the biologist W. Ford Doolittle uh, entitled, Is Nature Really Motherly? In, in which he took Gaia to the cleaners, or rather the theory. <laughs> Doolittle said, well, you'd have to imagine a committee of uh, all of the organisms on the planet getting together every year and deciding what the level of, uh, of oxygen would be in the atmosphere that year, you know. And obviously that, that, that's not going to work. And uh, they employed really talented writers like Richard Dawkins. Uh, uh, and I think uh, at the time... Uh, uh, Dawkins hated Gaia as much as he hates God, if you like to make a comparison. The danger, it's not exactly distressing or disturbing except to an academic biologist who values the truth, the danger is that they will say things like, the function of oxygen is to do so and so, the function of ammonia is, the function of methane is, because it implies that individual organisms that are manufacturing that gas are doing it for the good of the biosphere. The main thing that uh, Richard Dawkins said was there was no way for living organisms to regulate anything beyond their bodies, what he called their phenotypes. Uh, um, that uh, regulating the planet, the idea of organisms regulating the planet was quite absurd. The, the really key objection was how could Gaia evolve to be self-regulating? You would need that the organisms on the Earth had foresight in some way. What they saw as altruism on a global scale. They could be altruistic towards themselves or their kin, but that was the limit. Looking after the whole planet and everything on it was just ridiculous. And this is what stuck in the throats of most scientists. They felt that there was no way for Gaia to evolve by natural selection. It frightened all the other scientists off. Uh, almost everybody else became then anti-Gaia. It became impossible to publish a paper with uh, on the subject of Gaia in any scientific journal. It was a quite wicked censorship of uh, an idea. This was all the more frustrating because as far as I was concerned Gaia isn't against natural selection. In fact, natural selection is a critical part of Gaia. I spent a miserable year trying to find an answer to Richard Dawkins' criticisms. In an attempt to silence his critics, Lovelock set about building a computer model of a planet he called Daisy World. A model he hoped would prove Gaia's validity once and for all. I mean, it was a model of a simple planet that's orbiting the, the, a star like the Sun. And uh, this particular star 
like our own sun, warms up as it grows older. And the only life there is on, on Daisy World are daisies. One dark and one light. You won't get any germination until the, the surface is somewhere has warmed up to about 4 degrees Celsius. Then the first daisy seeds will germinate. The planet was quite cold. And what would happen at first was dark daisies would be favoured. It had been selected, naturally selected. Being dark, they'll absorb more heat than the, the, the surface, so they'll warm up first themselves and then their locality, so they'll start spreading. Quite rapidly, dark daisies grow and then spread and spread and spread, and the temperature zooms up, and so do they, in a strong positive feedback, until you reach a point where the planetary temperature is high enough for white daisies to grow. And then they start competing with the black daisies for space. And as the sun's heat gets warmer, so gradually the proportion of white increases. If it got too warm, then the white daisies, which tend to reflect radiation away, would cool the planet down. And the system would fall into a regulatory pattern. And the competition kept the temperature exactly at the optimum for daisy growth. And the whole thing's beautifully stable. The daisy world showed that evolution by natural selection is absolutely vital for Gaia. And there's no foresight. These things all happen by chance. It answered the criticism that life can't regulate the climate of the Earth. Well, they were right, it can't. But when life is part of a complete system, of the, uh, an atmosphere and a surface and so on, then it can regulate. It's not the life that's regulating, it's the whole system is regulating itself. It applies to the organisms and their environment. And for us on Earth, this means all life takes part in Gaia together with the atmosphere, oceans and surface rocks. What we find is that the system is locked in a sort of dance in which everything changes together. It's as if everything seems to be correlated with everything else. Just one example, you've got the circulation of the ocean, you've got the amount of ice on the surface as well. All of these things are working, are changing in concert. It's almost like a symphony. Daisy World was enough to allow scientists to start taking Lovelock's theory seriously. And as more and more interdependent systems are discovered, the core ideas behind Gaia are finally moving into the mainstream.